Hey, hello everyone. Hello. We're just out of this. I don't know if you can, can see, see if it's in reverse. Yes. And we're in the apocalypse. Yeah. Yes, uh, we'll have our patrons uh, giveaway entirely oh, free. No, it's entirely free for us. Uh, so, um. Small my head. What? I'm just joking about the, how far away we go. Ah, right, head. right. So, what do you feel uh, pre pre episode? Yeah, very good. That's really totally good. Cool. Louder, louder, louder. That's really totally enjoyed it. Cool. Ah, really yeah. Good. yeah. So was I. So we're going to talk about this. Uh, we're recording something else today, but tomorrow. Or oh, was it? Yeah. Is it tomorrow? Either way. Yeah. <laughs> See you around. Ooh, ooh, no such thing as a Hollywood ending. Ooh, ooh, no such thing as a Hollywood ending. Hello, everyone. I hope that was in time. Otherwise, God knows how many hundreds of pounds I wasted on drum lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Today Hello. is all about this. Anna and the Apocalypse. Absolutely. Anna and the Apocalyptic. Or Anna, we, we didn't have enough A's for the usual uh, thing displaying the title in the background. <laughs> Apocalypse. But, but you can see the poster. And that's the version for Scotland, obviously. Uh, I think they made uh, some versions with different flags, depending on where they were. Yeah, it's filmed just up the road. Well, I say just up the road if you're a port of Glasgow, you know. It's, port, a, it's, near, it's near about here, mm. farther up. Um, which is very cool. Absolutely. Um, I'll just start by saying happy birthday to Kirk Douglas. <laughs> yes. Anyway. It's unrelated, but the last episode we recorded was behind the candelabra with his son. And when I posted on Instagram a happy birthday to the dad, I didn't realize uh, that he was still alive. 102. <laughs> it, is, it is incredible. It is incredible. 102 is a hell of an age. That's a very you know? good go. Yeah. Because usually you think for blokes, the average age is around 80 plus, you're like doing really well as a man. Yeah. Women seem to last a lot longer, I think. Yeah. I don't know if that's changing, but it used to be the case that women lived longer than men. Yeah. Um, I think that's still the case. There's also the thing as well, um, sorry to any listener that's over six foot, um, shorter people live longer. Not because of dietary or anything, just because of the, the, the ability, the how much the heart has to work to pump blood around the body. So instead of the difficulty of having to push it up like six plus foot, uh, if you're shorter than like, you know, like five, four or whatever, the shorter you are, the less effort your heart has to do to pump blood around your body. So that's why shorter people on average live longer than taller people. Hmm. Um, also, Dalton Trumbo was born on the 9th of December. Trumbo. Yes. We... Good, good reference because um, the, what's his name? Jim? No, John. Is in Trumbo. Uh the 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 love interest of Anna. Okay, is he? Yeah, he is. Oh. I checked his IMDb he's, earlier. He's also in. Uh, well, I talked about that at, at some point, but yeah, okay. Oh, John, that, that's it. That John. makes sense. Yeah, he's uh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, we'll we'll probably have and because we haven't talked about movies set on about the movie industry yet. I think uh, Trumbo is a good one, and Ryan Cranston is playing. Trumbo and uh, Alan Tudyk is in that movie, but yeah, I think he's in uh, all movies ever now. Um, okay, so there are two origin stories. Um, so um, this year's Fringe Festival, when I went to see the uh, ACS shows, uh, I met in the queue someone we know called uh, Janet Lawson. Of course, yes. And she went to see the shows, and we had the occasion to talk for a while. And she talked to me about this Anna and the, Apoc um, Anna and the Apocalypse that was coming out uh, not so long after, and that she was in. Uh, what's it? Oh, that's quite cool. I, she was, uh, I, I, I saw her in a uh, hundred tables, uh, but the, the local band, they did a uh music video a few years back and i was in it well for a second and janet was also in it for a bit longer but the the, the video was ultimately scrapped for some reason so yeah. they didn't use it well whatever and so yeah so that was that and came september there was a premiere uh at the glasgow film theater 
where I saw Silas uh, for again, and he told me that. Uh, so the director of that film, uh, John McPhail, was at ACS during their year. They All did right, the, okay. mock, uh, uh, the mock audition, I think it was. Yeah, right. mock audition. The, the one we had with Paul and. Um, yeah. Oh God, Catriona. Yeah, so yeah, I was going. I was going to go Kate, but I'm like because I was always confused because. Isn't Kate the other one that was also in Isolani as well? Yeah, Kate McLaughlin. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but and we call no. Kat Riona Kat. Kat. So that doesn't help. Kat. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's why I was like, oh God, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I finally saw it. So that was in September. And then the film was finally released uh, on the 30th of November here in Scotland uh, a few days ago then. And I saw it again, and the third time with you guys. Jesus, you've been busy with this one. Yeah, I've been busy with this one. So basically, the origin story now of this film, um, in 2011, a young Scottish, uh, Scottish uh, chap named Ryan McHenry wrote and directed a short film called Zombie Musical. And uh, we'll have a link ready for you. It's already on our website. It's a short, it's a short film. That's the origin of this in 2013, Ryan's Vine series, Ryan Gosling Won't Eat His Cereal, became viral. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen Wait, it. Wait, the director of this is the guy that created that Vine? Nope, nope. All oh, um, right, I was uh, going to say. The, the director of the Zombies. short, and who was supposed to do that. Uh, but in 2015, Ryan McHenry passed away. Oh. And, oh. Yeah, and the zombie apocalypse uh, lives on in Anna and the Apocalypse, um, and John uh, MacPhail what is directing. And uh, but yeah, um, wasn't there oh, a tribute thing at the end of this? I don't think there was a tribute, but he's in the co-screenwriter. Oh, okay. What was it? I did see something recently. They did have a a tribute at the end of it, right? But I can't remember what it was. I don't think it was behind the car I thought it was this. No, it's but somewhere. Else. It's yeah, something I also watched recently. I've I have that in my notes somewhere, but I don't remember what it is right now. <laughs> um, there was a Q and A. Oh, there was a Q and A uh, after obviously the premiere in the, at the GFT, and it was cool because they talked about the fact that they loved and always had in mind uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and that musical episode. Still yeah. not seen it yet. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, um, where am I there? Ah. Yeah, I'll just. So it's actually starring um, Ella Hunt as Anna, Malcolm Cumming as John, Sarah Swire as Steph, and apparently she also did the choreography. And that's quite cool. Hmm. Christopher Lovo as Chris, Ben Wiggins as Nick, Marley Sue as Lisa, Mark Benton as Tony, Paul Kay as Savage, and Janet Lawson as Mrs. Hinsman. Good to throw Janet in the casting there, yeah. Yeah, she was good in this. Like, that's great. It's, um, yeah. um, Kat was also there, and she, we, we were wondering if she was probably one of the best, well, one of the most uh, interactive zombies there was. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as zombie acting goes, I think that's that Janet was up there because you see a lot of zombie films and it's all based on like the makeup and stuff, but there's an actual performance with Janet's in this. Um, which is kind of rare with zombie films. You're always like, you just start running and making noises, but there will seem to be a bit more going on, which was nice. Her physicality is really good. I yeah. mean, I mean, it would be because isn't she the president of? Yeah, she's now. She was the treasurer at some point, and now she's. I think she's the president. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's, she's now yeah. in charge. Yeah, yeah we, yeah, we talked about that also quickly. British Association. The, no, that's the British oh. um, BA. So, yeah, British Association of Stage and Screen Combat. What was it? Yeah. Stage British and Screen Asso Combat. Yeah. Yeah. B A S S C. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they talked in a Q&A quickly something that I didn't know, and it made you laugh when it happened. So, clearly, that's for Scottish people. I don't remember the name of the actress, well, of the person, the TV presenter. Oh, Jackie Bard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for those who don't know, uh, Jackie Bard is a is a BBC Scotland correspondent. She often hosts the Scottish six o'clock and ten o'clock news. Um, so she's like a prime time newsreader in Scotland. Mm. So that's why that Easter egg and cameo is quite good. 
That's like, great oh, that they got like, her. It's like Jackie Bards in this film. <laughs> yeah, I talked about the in the Q and A about the experience that it was her first time doing a fiction, so it felt really weird to have people telling her that what she was doing was good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're doing great. That's excellent, kind of thing. Because you, obviously you don't that have, have that. No, not, yeah, we're not with journalism now. Um, one of the guys during the Q and A, we could was respond. Well, well, <laughs> Was the culprit for the was responsible for the sexy child joke? Wait, what? Oh yeah. Um, who? How oh, do you mean, like? Oh, Nick, you're such a child, a sexy child. Uh, no way. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that so, was a good joke. I liked it. So, what do you mean? He, he wrote it. Well, there was a co-writer there, and you said, "Yeah, that's." Oh uh, right, I, that's I'm sorry. I thought for a minute, I'm like, hey, the joke came out of the Q and A. I was like, wait, how did they put the joke back in the movie? Sorry, that was just me getting confused. Well, actually, you know, the production, the, this movie was finished in 2017. It took a while to get it to global. Well, it's actually still limited, but you can't, it, it went like for five day, five dates, I think, mm. um, in Cineworld, and it's still at GFT, but yeah, I mean. Uh, Partly it's had an American release, but I don't know where. It has had an American it, release. Yeah, 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 before. it, It's, um, I think, uh, South. Uh, well, the, the world premiere was in the US. Right, okay. La last year, yeah. That's good. It's nice to see something very British, actually. It has the, it definitely has the feel of um, British cinema to this, mm. which is nice, especially when it comes to musicals, because there is, and you use a Nook's favorite word, I'm going to use it, um, the musical genre is very hard not to Hollywoodize. You know, like the pristine and clean, and just you know the the, the feel that musical theater does have. Ooh, uh, ooh, uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as Hollywood dies. Ooh, uh, <laughs> ooh, uh. Better stop before I get a copyright claim for this. <laughs> yeah, but well, no, it was nice the fact that uh, this probably as well, Jan, why you didn't immediately go, "Oh, this is a musical, I hate it," because it shied away from the some of the major tropes, although they're there in homage because that gets you into it I mean, for the, me it didn't feel overly musical yeah the the, the dialogue song ratio is quite nice mm. yeah. I mean, it's not it, it, you've got some story developing th through dialogue I, also i, I think yeah. that's quite a great choice um story-wise and it's di uh, directorial wise <laughs> get out eventually um the the more the film starts with a very musical feel and then as it gets more the apocalypse begins happening it slowly slips further and further away from a musical and slips into the the um the zombie horror role mm -hmm. i kind of describe this film to me as a as a coming of age story that is interrupted by a zombie apocalypse which is really <laughs> interesting because coming of age and and, and horror as two genres are often mixed you know, with um, Anouk was talking to me last night about It Follows, which, am I right in saying that's about if you if you sleep with somebody, you get this disease, mm -hmm. almost like Ring, in a way? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't heard like a Q&A with the director or any of the production company, but it's basically about once you sleep with someone... Um, this disease leaves you and goes to the, the person that you slept with. Mm. And I feel like there's like a kind of STD feel to it. Like once you've, and, and it's also coming of age because you have to also learn about these things, you know, like yeah. sex well, and the, all this kind of stuff. Where I was going with it is the idea of losing innocence. The coming of age story often is about that you are capturing the last moments of your youth. You know, if we go like American Graffiti, where the cast are driving around before they all leave and go their separate ways after high school, or they're going to go to college, they're going to get a job, or even more recent, or even going and then to the horror genre, um, with especially because this is Anna as our protagonist. If we go back to say like Nosferatu, and we have the the sacrifice of the of I can't remember the wife's name in Nosferatu. Um, I want to say Helen. But how she basically gives her life, the the mm -hmm. whole coming back to the that horror can be used, yeah, 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 for innocence and innocence sake, because she she is on she is innocent because she's she hasn't met Nosferatu, she hasn't gone on the same journey, but she learns and sacrifices herself ultimately 
because so in a way there are multiple things that you can horror and coming of age can link together with similar ideas and i think that's done quite well here as well yeah um, it's like learning right like it's kind of the most brutal learning hmm. uh arch arc that she did but she pretty much lost everything before she then left the town that she was brought up in yeah um she lost her best friend her father she'd already lost her mom and the friends that she now has made are kind of not really her friends in the beginning yeah so it's, yeah it's like it's interest i thought found that interesting because it's kind of metaphorical like you kind of have to leave everything behind lose everything mm. before you really know who you are and what you need while i remember um there's a french film we should definitely look at uh, on the back of this maybe in the start of new, the new year called i think it's 400 days it's a coming it's like a coming of age classic that everyone refers to if they direct coming of age movies i don't know that one it, it, it ends with the, the the child on the beach turned around and looks at the camera it's a fa- it's, ah, it's the a black really and white one yeah it's a famous french film but i i can't remember the full title but that, Les Quatre Cent Coups? it might be i'll look up right Is that now. Renoir? well i don't could be yeah uh malcolm so malcolm coming as john was also i saw him on stage when they did the scottish production of cyrano oh right he was there yeah i saw it right after watching uh Anna and apocalypse actually and uh ben wiggins so that's nick yeah i just saw him as the more way more important role than uh, Malcolm had in uh, well, so Ben Wiggins was in uh, Anthony and Cleopatra. Oh, really? Yeah. Both of them have really good um, faces. They've got really good looks, and uh, Ben Wiggins is definitely like he's got such a musical, th- like or theatre face. Like it's so chiselled, and it's like he looks really musical theatre in fo- a good way. The four hundred blows. Is the film nineteen fifty nine? Les Quatre Right, yeah, yeah. But sorry, <laughs> that is the. We should talk about that as well because I watched an excellent thing on BBC iPlayer hosted by Mark Commode, but he goes through different genres. So there's sci fi, horror, coming of age, and others. Um, and he talks about that, and I was like, okay, that's we should probably look at that. And have yeah, because it looked really interesting. Because so every coming of age film seems to take something from the four hundred blows. So right. Mm. We should look at that. There are plenty of inspirations that I've noticed. I see there was the, um, the Spielberg really reveal when they're all in the bubble thingy, and then uh, the uh, the army. You read the guy. Oh yeah. The, oh, they, mm. well, the army. Well, just look for yourself, and you see everyone, and then boom, you see outside. Uh huh. Mm. And obviously, some Edgar Wright reveals. Right. Yeah. Like the the zombie head that was just behind the. Then Anna's seat, well, on the I don't know how you call those balançoire thing, uh, the the pl- the child playground thing. When she yeah, was it's, it's um, swings. Uh, no, it was the seesaw. Oh, wasn't seesaw! It? Yeah. When she when she hits it down and then it hits the zombie in the head. No, that's the first one when she was seated. The swings. The swings. Swings. Sorry, right. you were yeah. right. Yeah, so there were plenty of stuff like it was jelly beaning nicely into the fact that. Uh, yeah, she, she, there was this thing, and then you couldn't see, and then oh, the guy, the the zombie for the first time was actually the head just behind her. Everything, oh yeah, def- and I mean because Adam, do you want? Sorry, do you want? To- no, no, go on. I can come back to it, isn't it? Um, um, even uh, said this to me in the cinema that they have Shaun of the Dead, um, homages. There are two two scenes which are literally taken from Dawn of the Dead. Uh, yeah, that was Dawn of the Dead. That's yeah. right. Um, so the, the one, sorry. The, sorry, no, we're cutting each other off. <laughs> it's fine. We're all very excited. The one that was a long take in Shaun of the Dead, right? Uh, yeah, so the when they're both singing... Yes. And they're not seeing the chaos around oh, them. Oh, you mean that? I, I, when I saw that, I thought of um, Dawn of the Dead. Even in the, in the, I don't know if it's in the, I can't remember if it's in the original. It probably is. But in the remake recently, um, she discovers that the apocalypse happens in her like, in like that sort of estate area. And she like runs outside and every, it's all chaos at the yeah. same time. So when Anna's like walking with the headphones and singing, that's what I was thinking of like, oh, this is like Dawn of the Dead when she comes out of the house and all the chaos is happening in the housing estate. Right. And then obviously later on we get, we get almost two. We get a half one with the unfortunate death of John, which I have to say I didn't see coming. Oh my, it shocked which is, me. Which is really well done. When he sacrificed himself, I'm like, oh, is this the Dawn of the Dead where they like tear the arms off? Or in Shaun of the Dead when it, 
Um, the guy it's from Black Books, Dylan Morris. Morin. Morin is torn, torn, apart, torn yeah. apart. No, we get that later with the uh, with the villain, which is the same in Dawn of the Dead. That is where that scene. It's in every harm, every any zombie film worth its salt has something like that scene in it where somebody, the main villain, is torn apart. Even well, to the extent in Dead Set, we see it as well. Yeah, I was to, just about to say the Charlie Booker. Brooker. 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 Um, yeah, the guy that you're supposed to really hate is just terrorized by 20 um, zombies. We'll talk, and you see yeah. guts coming out. Like, it's so brutal. We'll talk about Dead Set at some point. But um, the the other one was when they're in the bowling alley and he hits the the music box and it starts playing music. That's I, I taken met, I, from I, yeah, that's so. taken from Shaun of the Dead as well. Even though the song is immediately loud, and they use it as like they hit the zombies on the time of the beat of oh. the song in Shaun of the Dead. They, <laughs> they don't do it so much in this in Anna and Apocalypse. But I was like, as soon as he, what is that thing called? The um, music A jukebox. Jukebox. Thank you. Um, he like hits it, and the music comes on. And so as soon as that happened, I was like, that's the Shaun of the Dead reference. I did like, I did like anytime you see that, just the scene where they're whacking the crap out of the bartender with the, to the don't stop me now. Yeah. With pool, pool, pool cues. It's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good scene. I love that movie but, so much. Um, so Ste- yeah, those Ste- are the two that I saw. Stuff is great. Like there's the zombie just, they, they are bad, they are fighting and then the hands of the zombie are ending up on our, on our boobs. Yeah, and she's, she's, she's like, going. "Don't you fucking!" <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Uh, and then what, what's, what's that actress's name? Because I think I'm going to check if it's the same person, but I don't. Steph. Yeah. Was it Swire? Um, Sarah Swire. Sarah Swire. Yeah, yeah. He, the, I was wondering if she was actually American or where she's actually from, because there were moments where she um, sounded something else, but I don't know if that's because she's she, her her accent is. Or if she's putting on an American accent. Anyway. There is a... um, What I would start to define from now on as organic exposition. Where someone who is not aware about the show Don't Tell uh, rule would just have a character say, Oh, today is the 23rd of December. No, here you've got Anna waking up. And then just leaving a room, there is a two seconds delay, and then she comes back and remove the thing from the advent calendar yeah. on the twenty third. Got to, got to do that. Absolutely. I mean, that will. If you've been watching any of our occasional thing that's on Instagram of me opening my calendar, um, you know, you got to get the advent calendar open. You got to do it. You, you, you wake up and to do it. It's a nice, a nice little way of showing the date. Yeah, there are plenty um, of little things like this. They just they don't tell you. Yeah. I mean, again, that's it's like nice. in, in in Dawn of the Dead, not Dawn of the Dead, in Shaun of the Dead as well, when he gets up to go to work and the door is still open, you know? And when we go past, we see that um, that the dad hasn't returned. Sorry, I was swallowing. Um, the That that moment there, the reveal of like something's not right. It's like, oh, the dad never came home. Mm-hmm. So there's all this sort of stuff as well. That's, there's a lot of good stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about it later on when we talk about it. Um, you like to say that, don't you, Adam? I do, because... Well, we'll talk about this at another time. Well, we'll, we'll get there and the, progre- the, the story and the, the progression of it, of how it slowly changes from upbeat theme to darkness as well. There, well, there is something that's been bugging me for a while, and they, it happens here. Um, but it's fun. It's it's weird. Uh, something in life I never understood. I still don't. When you learn in a movie, and uh, um, I guess it also happens in real, yeah, happens in real life. But when you're with a friend and you learn that I don't know their mother died, why is there always the line? And I, I, I know I'm not using that line because I don't see the point. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and the, 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 I, I've seen lately someone who actually knew the mum. So that's just, okay, that's okay. But by that, I don't. I just don't get it. Well, I think I think that because it's you forget because um, I, had, I had somebody in my primary school mother died of um, I think it was breast cancer. Um, and as you got older, you would say like, 
if you if you brought up oh my mom did this if the person was around you would you would you would forget and i think the the line i'm so sorry comes out of like in a human response of like you don't you don't think about other people especially in moment usually in film and in this one here where that moment comes from the other character being frustrated at their life you know like my plight is worse than yours and they say the thing and then they realize because they're a decent human being they go oh shit i i, I didn't even think i should have thought so i think that's where that sort of line does come from the idea that we're not you don't you don't you it's not like you're saying Oh yeah, I know your mom's dead. I'll say this anyway, and you don't have any feeling. Like if you're a normal human being with compassion, and you realize you say something like that, you would be like, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I am sorry. I didn't mean to upset you." Do Do you mean that, like, why we just, we say that as 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 human beings? Like, why we like if someone says, "Oh, you know, my my dad just died. Oh, I'm so sorry." Yeah, and all, like yeah. that response. Yeah. Um. I think it's a really British thing to do because it's almost like saying, I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. That's how I take it. And what, it's also a thing of like, what else do you say? I you know, know it's, it's something to immediately be like, to say, to acknowledge what, the fact that it's awful, but also you, not make what, it awkward. Because you can't, it's not, the worst thing you can say is... Um, how? <laughs> no, not, not that. It's just like, I, I know what you're going through sort of thing. It's like trying to, you know, relate to something that is so far away is is difficult and you don't want to seem ingenuine by saying something like oh i'm i know how, i i know it must be a tough time i know you must be really hurting right now you don't want to be that sort of person saying like i know how you feel so the safety act the safety response to say i'm, I'm sorry for your loss and i'm so sorry but in that way you are being you know that person mm -hmm. it's ironic you want to escape being something and then by saying that you are that person because everyone knows that's the the immediate response. I, I it's a formality now, I feel. I just don't... I mean... Are you a sociopath, no, Jan? Is I that why you're not saying these things? No, I just don't... Uh, I don't crack a joke immediately about how the mother was... No, no, I just don't say anything. Just like I was in a situation a few years back, which is very weird, going to a funeral because you were around and you know nothing about the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is weird. And obviously, there is this moment when there is a line and everyone goes to say, pay their respects or whatever to the remaining ones. Yeah. And then you have to find, to find something to say. Yeah. So, well, I managed to find something around. Well, that, that is difficult because that is a situation where you are coming up to the person and it's, in some cases, it can be seen of like, what do you say? There is no... Uh, you're right what do you say there that, and honestly I'm sorry for your loss and being uh, having been in that situation you're not it's not that you don't care what the people are saying to you it's like you're kind of numb to the situation anyway you know see, see i didn't see myself i could say i'm sorry for your loss that was more in the lines of be brave kind of thing yeah, yeah that's fine you in know that, yeah. in that terrible experience exactly but when it's in the past or in the stuff that we're actually talking about yeah i just yeah just don't say anything or, or act it, sadness i don't that, know but i it, yeah i just don't I think I think in film the more annoying one is when they say something and immediately like grab their mouth like oh I didn't mean to say that like the whole I shouldn't have said that idea mm -hmm. rather than this person saying I'm so sorry because they realize they've put their foot in it so I feel that naturally that's quite that is what people do well it's uh, it, it it's it's just something that you can say yeah and then you can carry on just so that you know they know that you've heard them and it's not awkward. It's just like, I'm really sorry that you went through that or mm. I'm sorry for your loss, etc. And then you can move on if you don't, you know, if they don't want to talk about it or you don't need to get like, it's just something that you, that you say It's again. Yeah. It's like a formality. Mm. Um, it makes things a little bit less awkward. I guess. Okay. Uh, entirely unrelated, but uh, Adam, you talked about that and I also immediately thought about that when I saw the guy. Um, may we get John McFay on one episode at some point? Yes. Absolutely, I'd love yes, to. I would love that. Yeah. I've, really I, good. I've got nothing but positive to say about this movie, actually. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into it even more, but... I went... He, he does... He captures something that I haven't really seen in... Balanced before in a horror film and a, and a musical at the same time, so I'm, I'm mightily impressed. Yeah. And I'd love to know what was going on 
in his own head. If, if it's more, in, if it's inspired by more coming of age, or if it's inspired more by different horror films, because there's a lot of stuff in here that's like excellently balanced homages. Yeah. On on the back of that premiere that happened in September, there was in October for ten days. Um, he actually had his uh, one of his. I think it was his first um, full feature. Where do we go from here? Which was a very nice, lovely about a guy in a retirement home. Hmm. Uh, so if we got him, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll talk about that also. Just cool. so you know. Yeah, sounds great. I'd uh, love to have him on if he was up to it. Up yeah. For it. Yeah. And maybe also because I actually told her and give her my card, Janet, at some point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be great. Yes, that would be really cool. Um, yeah, I think th my main thing that I liked about this film was that in the beginning they weren't like they all had their own problems mm. and I feel like sometimes because they want that um, balance everything's great and then suddenly it's awful or everything's mundane or like everyday life and then the zombie apocalypse happens but in this one it feels like it's going to be a coming of age film where she decides if she's going to Australia or not, mm. or she decides that she falls in love with John at the end, because you know, that's what, how most films end. Oh, he's just my geeky friend. And then they fall in love. Um, or, you know, uh, Nick grows up to be someone who's actually likable. And he, you know, he just puts up a wall. Um, and, uh, Elise, Lisa, no, not Lisa, the blonde American one. What's her name? Uh, Steph. 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 Thank Lisa you. is the is the drama drama cliques. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! With, with get Christmas to song. That's a oh great Christmas song. It's shocking. Um, so they all have their problem, and actually, uh, the interesting one is that Steph wants to talk about something that's real. Like, why don't we talk about how homelessness is a real big problem, mm. and we're not talking about things that actually need to be, you know, talked about and discussed. Um, and then all these problems kind of seem to go away because they're everyone is dead <laughs> and then they start killing off people that you got connected to and it's like okay this actually bec became really real mm. and it's one of the reasons why i quite liked um shawn of the dead as well because it kills off like it makes it more real and it's not about sensationalism it's actually just the fact that if there was a zombie zombie apocalypse not everyone's going to survive like there might just be three people leaving a town literally um, mm. um on, the, yeah. on the subject of um john john is absolutely who i was in high school I really that am. is and it was kind of surreal for me to watch this i'm like there is a film that's captured how a lot of people like how i felt at school i'm like this is kind of incredible so that made it even more heart wrenching and annoying when he got when he when he got done in. I'm like, oh god! I'm yeah. like, because I always like you always think as anybody go, oh, I'd be fine in a zombie apocalypse, and yeah. you're watching this going, oh, I'd probably go out doing something like that. Probably, yeah. yeah. Um, I really wanted them to get together as well. I thought they were really cute as a ah, couple, and that's why this film is works on so many levels. The film tells you in the in his first song that he is not going to make it. And that's not going to happen. I mean, the song's called "Not a Hollywood, N Not a Hollywood Ending." Yeah. It tells you right there. It's like I don't get the girl. This isn't going to happen, you know. And you want it to happen, and it, that is twisted away from you oh. because you're because you know because of the the great framing device that is a musical. You think, oh, it's going to work out in the end because name a musical that it doesn't really work out in the end, and La La Land doesn't count. Yeah, because. It kind of does work. Well, they get they get what they want, but they don't get to be together. Umbrellas are shabble doesn't work out. That's true. Um, um, I feel like that was quite nice about this film. It, it I mean, it it was a film, and there were moments where it was feel good and might not be like reality. Um, but it it there were the characters felt real mm. and felt a bit more kind of um, like had a few dimensions to them. And everything wasn't romanticized. Like, I think that image of um, the couple that both become zombies at the same time and they like pass each other and they hold hands for like a second and then they like walk past each other. I thought that's such a genius idea because mm. it's like they've lost something that they're not 
who they were before. Yeah. Um, they're like not alive anymore, but they are. Like it's it's a weird one, but um, you just realize how much so many of the characters have have lost something. Getting a bit of Mean Girls vibes as well from that whole Christmas show oh, moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what what a great what a great scene the yeah the school the school moment which kind of is almost the beginning of the inciting incident just before it happens um, yeah because that because the headmaster then leaves doesn't he and he hears the, the banging, zombies yeah. outside um that's actually a really good point because in mean girls it's the same thing it's like a christmas show that you think is going to be like you know for children and like festive and bubble and positive and all this stuff and then it's like totally sexual yeah, it's 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 um, phenomenal. I've been listening to the the soundtrack because I wanted to do a bit of music analysis for this, and I've I've noticed some really interesting things that I'll talk about when we get to the music. But oh, great! Um, that whole song is is marvelous in a way of like how I love um, Ricky Gervais's life, David Brent Life on the Road, where those songs are funny because they're they're because they're, they're written, you know, badly but goodly at the same time. Um, this one is just goodly, goodly. This one is just pure gold the whole way through because you're like, you try and work out if A, well, obviously she wrote it. Um, oh, did she? Well, the character surely wrote oh, it. Oh, the That's character not a real, wrote it. Yeah. You can imagine because it's her part of the show, she's written this piece and you're trying to work out like, is she writing, is she doing it ironically? Is she doing it genuinely? Did she see the irony? Does she not? I know. There's all this, there's all these multiple layers to it that you're like, is that a you, message to a boyfriend? Yeah, you know, yeah. it could be anything there. You're all you're trying to work out, and it really just presents what a character is in one song. It's like, and that's what's in musicals. If you get that moment, that's that's excellent because when it, you get your first character's song, and a lot of things is like, okay, this is who they are. Um, like yeah. think West Side Story when you start with the the whole, um, the dance sequence in the beginning with the characters. That's through dance, but you definitely get an identity of who these two gangs are and their relationship between each other. So sure. the, f the first song for a, a character is always important to see who's, to get a personality across. And I think that song in particular does very well. Although the, the halibut fish rap is pretty good too. <laughs> the, um, actually, it's interesting as well, because if you watch it again, that Hollywood ending song is probably a lot more poignant than it would have been the first time that you watch it. Because it's, quite a lot of the things that they talk about they it, it's like true as you're saying like john doesn't get the girl he dies um and the, the two couples die um and anna sings about how um the guy nick um is basically like a dickhead she doesn't really care that he's like spreading rumors about her or that sort of thing that's and they become friends pretty much yeah they they consolidate over what went wrong yeah. although if there's anything i was a bit like the film i wish the film had done more no i was disappointed and it's just like their relationship i was kind of confused but maybe i missed something i wasn't like i missed must have missed it about her and nick right i mean yeah I w the thing is is was i was talking about earlier uh, about organic exposition you don't get you get some it's it's i think it's perfectly done i mean y yeah you don't you don't see i mean i always as it's a musical i will have more trouble to analyze what's said in the song because i enjoy the melody more than the words <laughs> okay so uh, so what I, i'm coming from a place that I, I probably didn't really understand the whole movie because the songs i'm just enjoying uh, the melody and the, how mm. it goes with the lyrics. So I'm probably missing a few things. But, um, yeah, I think it was how how it was done, the, their relationship, and the fact that they had something. And I think it was, uh, well, it felt, it didn't feel as uh, blatantly, uh, just like, the, like they had in... Um, the illusionist, like coming out of the blue. There, there no, was, no, I don't mean that. I mean, I... I I may, I, I'm wondering if I missed something, but you do. Obviously, when he's, you know, the, the sexy child line flirting bit, like you get in that scene that they have history. He isn't just like the jock hitting on a pretty girl. You do get that as well. So there is in there. It was just, I was not, I wasn't totally, I was totally not 
I was like, I couldn't work out. Like, did they? Are they? Were they a thing? Does he just fancy her? Has he heard rumors about if she's you know up for it as you do in school? Um, Before so the I couldn't... Hollywood song, the the fact that he looks at her and does that annoying you know two fingers up and licking the in the middle and it's like oh he does does he do that oh my god is that that's why i laughed i I missed that that scene i'm so sorry no he looks at her and he does the the obvious you know uh yeah Yeah, he's not twisting the tongue that much but it starts yeah i saw i must have missed that he's about to yeah sorry so um at that point i was like oh they must have slept together or he's heard something happened yeah and then when she's like, oh, I don't even care. I was like, oh, well, then he must have slept with her and then left her the next day. Which, but then confused me because he's flirting with her. So I was a bit confused. But then when he talks about, you know, before, just before he talks about, oh, I had to kill my dad. Um, a bit of a feminist moment. Just, you know, because I have to talk about this every single episode. Um, you don't do it every episode. When, we haven't uh, done it since Ghostbusters. Well, well, I liked it because h- h- she was like, I don't care about the sex. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> like, there's this whole thing. It's like, oh, no, everyone knows that I slept with this person. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like women do sleep with people, you know? Like, I liked how she immediately was like, I don't care about the fact that people know that I slept with you. It's about the fact that afterwards you, th- you pretended that you didn't know me. And we actually mm. had a really long chat about our parents and our situations. So why are you acting like an asshole afterwards? Like the sex doesn't matter. Well, we're on that line as well, actually, with strong female protagonists. They had a lot of alien moments, you know, because Anna is the leader of the group. And if you think in zombie horror, you think like Walking Dead, Rick, the leader. And mo- most zombie films, it's the, it's the guy that is already been... Um, I think it's Killian, it's Killian Murphy that's 28 Days Later. I believe it's him, right? With, it's him and, um, what was her name that did Moonlight and uh, James Bond? Naomi Harris. I oh, think it's right. Killian Murphy that's the, the well, I can't remember, I think it's him as the actor, but he's the main guy. A lot of the time in in horror, it, it's, you know, unless you're doing, the the female isn't the, isn't leading the group. Except Alien twists it, and I mean, there are, obviously Laurie Strom is quite is is a beginning of that in the seventies with Halloween, but not totally to where we are in this film, where it's kind of a bit of both. Like there's the vulnerability that Laurie kind of has, being like a young teenager being chased by Michael Myers, and the strongness of like a a powerful female character like Ripley. So there's a nice balance of humanity between two. Um, that makes it feel a lot it makes a nice real a realistic character because you can relate to her because you i can i can remember girls that were like that like had a really quite hard exterior or what could seem as a hard exterior but in reality are are just human beings that for some reason at school the front comes up so i thought that was quite it's nice really to see a, a quite well rounded and well portrayed female character so I thought that yeah. was pretty good too. And so credit to the writing here. Someone that sticks to her guns as well. You know, as soon as someone says something, they're not like, oh yeah, I'm going to fake, you know, who I am. Mm. It's just, this is who I am. And um, it might be tough through school, but I quite liked how she stuck to who she was yeah. the whole way through. There is a scene I think you missed, Adam, because you were to the loo at I that point. I had to point. pee, yeah. Uh, which is, I think, is the moment when John realized that he was not going to get the girl. At one point, oh yeah, he, um, they are in a, how do you call those things at the shops? Caddies? No. Shopping cart. Shopping cart, cart yeah. And Anna is in there, and they're talking, and then she says something like, uh, well, you're, John, you're my best friend here. And she's like, he's like, uh, don't, just having this face, John. And then she reiterates, no, no, you're my best friend. And yeah. then you see on his face, like, ah, yeah. right. Huh, I wonder if I'd seen that moment, uh, the, the death would have been more obvious to me. Well, that was that was her way of saying stop. <laughs> like I'm, we're just going to be friends. Mm-hmm. And then he, which which interested me because I actually didn't know if she knew that he liked her. So that was the first time that I realized that she knew, and that was her kind of shy way of being like, I'm not interested. Well, lucky for us, we have a female host of the podcast. So, do you know? 
say if you have a group of friends, have you? I don't know if you've ever had this. Like you, you hang out. Did you have a best friend that was a boy? Like you hung out with a lot that turned out that fancied you at some point. Did that ever happen to you? Um. <laughs> or female, or female actually. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. Did you know that they liked you in that way? Yeah. Right. You can usually tell um, because there are certain things that they'll say, there are looks, there are, you know, like it's really hard to not show that you like someone. Mm. Um, girl or boy, you know, like I feel like it's, and it's tough and it's it's tough to watch someone that you like being flirting or whatever with someone else because it you it's hard not to take that personally mm. so um yeah i quite i quite liked how they made I, what i liked about it as well is that they were all quite likable and there's um i think there are quite a lot of films where you know everyone has to be totally stereotypical in a box mm. like and john wasn't really a stereotypical geek or nerd or weirdo or he didn't say really crass things to Anna you know like he was just this normal lovely guy who just happened to fancy his best friend and she didn't feel the same way and I I feel like do you mean John I think you said Nick did I I think you said Nick did you oh sorry Uh, to be fair Nick was quite stereotypical but then he it comes out later that he's actually just got you know a father who's who was in the army and well, he's, obviously is he's very like broken. He, he's like her he puts up the front of being like the hard man because of the mates he hangs about with because especially in the first in the song no such thing as a hollywood ending one of them wants to get up and dance and they don't they're like no stay down yeah yeah so sure. you know which is more funny when they have a dance number later on yeah. yeah, I really like that song. With um, with the overlapping, we didn't hear that. Yeah, um, Nick is a bit broken. Yeah, mm. yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, I I don't know. I, I of course there were stereotypes that that's most films have to because you have to connect with the characters right in some yeah. way, um, and you have to understand characters quite quickly. So that's why films use stereotypes so much. Um, but I think they were a lot more subtle than they could have been. And I think it's been kind of done so many times. Like the geek wants the really pretty girl and doesn't get her because he's just, you know, has braces and thick glasses and has no dress sense at all. And it's like, well, life doesn't really work out like that. I don't know. I feel like it was nice to not have, it felt like you were watching a real school because uh, also because everyone had different accents, which I thought was awesome. Because that's just real life. I could be as wrong. As you can hear Sorry. on this podcast. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I could be wrong. Um, I'd have to ask if we did get him on. Um, I believe the school that they use as the set is the school that they used for... Now, what was it called? It was a BBC thing at schools. It was a drama series. I think it went out everywhere. And now I can't. Waterloo Road. Waterloo Road. It looked like one of the schools that they used for Waterloo Road. I see what you mean. It might the one where the teacher like fell off the roof. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think it might be that. It it looked like one of those. Because why wouldn't it be? I mean, if it's filmed in Scotland, I know loads of people that went off to do Waterloo Waterloo Road um, when I was at high school. That they were part of an agency that they could get that gig. So if that is, that's quite cool. To talk a bit about Scotland and talk about homelessness. Uh, that's one of the two main reasons why I left Facebook. Last year, there was a social bite, which is, well, I don't remember exactly what it is, but basically they had this plan so, to, to make want, the slip in the park. Do you want me to explain social bite a wee bit? Because I know a little yeah. about it. Social bite is a, it's like a cafe or like a, a charity organization that basically when you walk in, you can get your, your coffee and whatever, and you can also pay for somebody else's. So the idea is that you buy a homeless person that can come in and they can they can get a coffee or a sandwich or whatever because you've already paid for it. So it's already paid for. So they can walk off and get like a hot drink or whatever. And they've recently, which you're going to go and explain, have done this charity thing where they sleep in a park. Because it was yesterday. It was last night. It was this year's one. 
Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting this concept because I went to Morocco for a, a few weeks, and they have this in the souks, like they, well, they, the the shop, well, the, well, the, that side's called the shops, the souks. Well, plenty of so anyway. Um, they keep all the vegetables that are not readily available for being sold or whatever in one specific corner, mm. but hidden. So the guy, the people coming can still maintain the dignity while taking some of the food, right? Kind of thing. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. So yeah, uh, sleep in a park. It started last year. So the idea is to um, collect money for uh, last year. It was to build a shelter uh, to build a whole fast facility to have rooms and sleep. Basically, kind of an hotel for a, a well, hostel, kind a host, of thing. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to get rid of homelessness in Scotland, pretty much. Mm. So this sleep in the park is one night. Um, so to enter, which I did last year, but it, it didn't go through because Facebook. Well, anyway, so you you pay yourself fifty quid to get into the thing, mm. and then you have to validate the thing. Have some other people add at least that. Right. So that's a hundred. So then you have your ticket to go sleep the whole night in Edinburgh on the 9th of the December right, around. Okay. And all night you've got uh, artists. Uh, I think there was Stephen Fry last year. Or something, and you, depending on what you give, uh, the amount of people you manage to bring, uh, to bring mm. uh, you get special evening with those artists or whatever. Mm. And no one um, added anything to the pot last year. When you signed up, yeah, I signed up and I, uh, I went, I, I created an event and I publicized everything on my Facebook, and nothing, uh, nothing came through. It is tricky with fundraising because when you put, so I think there's a difficulty with Facebook and with social media in general that there's an air of disconnect if you just put a post up because it's so easy for somebody just to say, "Oh, I like that." And that's and enough. On. They've can that's their commitment. Yeah. yeah. Whereas with something like that, you go, you can sign up, uh, and you just put it on your wall. People can just ignore it. Whereas I reckon you have to chase it. You know, you have to message people going, "Hey, would you, do you mind? Could you donate?" And so on and forth. Yeah. Like it has to be a more like like you would do in the old fashioned days. You would go around to people's houses, which I had to do when I did fundraising at school, and ask. I'm doing a sponsor this and this. Would you would you like to give any money for it? Yeah, well, maybe you wonder how you're doing it because on the same week I had some uh, a Facebook friend uh, collecting funds for some people that were way way farther uh, education for girls in Africa, which is also nice. Uh, but uh, I yeah I didn't manage to to get anything for any uh, lo locally. I think. I don't know. I remember. I remember there was an altercation with that as well when you posted that, which wasn't. I just don't understand the disconnect between trying to do an event that can help. You know, the problem is with so many charities that sometimes you, we judge a charity straight away because we're like, is that because you don't know whether all the money is going to like raising awareness or it's going straight to a cause. Like, there's been multiple cases of like you find out latterly that. Oh, the weird the money gets spent on um yeah and the like awareness, of which is the case of like say some people I don't know who I won't say names because I don't know the companies that do such and such but some people get paid money to do the with the with the clipboard walking down the high street um and that counts as raising awareness so that's where the, some of the money goes which is like isn't that a false economy because you're literally just giving that person money. You know, I, as opposed to giving it to the charity. I think as well, like it, it's very easy to um, judge. You know, say, um, oh, don't you think it's slightly patronizing to do it for one night when these people have to, are homeless, like for years and years and years? And it's like, but if it's sponsored and the money is going towards buying a shelter or sorting out things for people that are going through that surely it's not because you're doing it for a reason i think that we've lost touch with why you're doing something it's it it's not because oh look see i can do it also or, like look how you know oh we survived ha 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 like <laughs> it's 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 not it's also not going to help anyone if you are like oh yeah let me try this out for a year like 
you might as well do it for one night and try and sponsor, get sponsored and get money for shelters. Because that's yeah. the only way that people on the streets will get food, water, um, sanitary products even, mm. um, a bed. Like, you know, it's... You know- you know it's not even like what's the big deal about or you're sleeping outside how is that anything like what they go through yeah but what the fuck is a sponsored bungee jump got to do with raising money for like cancer research it's like it doesn't it doesn't even i would say the the sleeping in the park the sense of solidarity because surely that it's well for instance when i was at high school one of them one of the most important events that happened to me at high school and made me grow up is we did a we did a battlefields tour, which is when they we went from we drove all the way down to from across to Britain to Belgium and France to look at World War One graveyards and battlefields, and we learned about the, the, we went to the places and learned history from people that were no well not people that there but people that now look after these sites, and uh, we saw for example like I posted on my Instagram it was on my Facebook which is called um, Tiet Val, which is a memorial for missing people and that were never found during the battle of um, the Somme um, and it's it's huge and there's about 70 I think there's 77,336 names on it um, and that event me going to see all these things and learn about these personal stories like there was a boy I think it's Daniel Sturridge who, died, who was 14 and he's buried next to his father because they both died in combat because the dad went out because the son had signed up so he went I'm not going to let my own son go out on his own and he joined the same regiment and went out with his son so they both went out together Mm. but the point was that because i'd seen these things for myself and experienced you know because we went the 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 premise of the trip is you are like a battalion you we were the i think we were like the seventh um queen anne which was the high school i went to um pals pals battalion because that was a thing in the first world war you all signed up together and you all got signed into the same battalion and regiment um which had a devastating effect here in Scotland because it wiped if you lots of small towns were complete and the men were wiped out because they would all die together. They all went to the same battle. They all went all went in the same the same battle and they all died. That was that small town ruined because all the men were dead. You know that was it. The the population decreased and those towns eventually would die out because unless people moved in. Anyway, because we went as this group, we bonded together like what would happen to these people that went there. And it gave you a newfound respect for, you know, like Remembrance Sunday. And like, I always have open conversations with people that don't support, like, wearing a poppy because of, like, because I've been to these places and I've seen the pe- the, the graves and the amount of people that gave their lives for, the, for a cause. You know, it gives you a found respect. So in the same regard with Sleep in the Park, I think that's quite a good idea. Because if you spend one night absolutely freezing... And then, because I have, so, I've seen a few people that I know have done it on the on Instagram, and one of them posted on their story when they got home, they were like a photo of their bed, like I've never been more happy to be here. And I'm like, that's that's exactly the point, because when you get home and you can get into the bed, you realise, well, they don't, they, homeless people can't do this. You know, I'm 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 lucky in my chance that I I've experienced what they've experienced, and I get to go home. And now because I I know what that feels like, I should try. I I want to help people feel how i felt exactly you know so i think that's i think the idea of sleeping in a park is not i don't think the idea of it's like what, what's that going to do how's that helping is that not how you how can you relate to that it's, it's insulting because they have to do it every night is the wrong attitude to have with it I know it's it. a similar it's a way of experience experiencing something that somebody else has i think yeah yeah if you're Definitely. doing just like sorry I said definitely. Sorry, go on. Just like you did your research with all those places, uh, I did, well, even though I didn't remember what social wa- bite was, I did my research on what they were before mm. uh, uh, trying to get into that. Uh, so it, it also depends how it's presented. On uh, like yesterday, I went to do some shopping after uh, the movies because I went to see movies all this week, <laughs> and uh, I was. Uh, I questioned myself for a second when I was out of the Sainsbury's. You know those boxes with like for the uh, that says um, that you can leave. Oh, for the food bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, I just purchased two full bags of stuff. What happens if I just leave them in that? They get picked up and taken to 
um, different food banks because they. I think in Sc- in Scotland, I know a good few places, and actually, Pasha and Christie would be the two to talk to because they've just done a play about food banks. So they and they did a. They thought it was a bit silly because the the director went, "You should go and you should go to a food bank and help out for one day." And they were like, "Oh, I don't want to be you know like method acting as that, not a bit too method." But well, they went. So and- would the people that are actually going be like, "Well, oh, these actors, that's a bit like." patronizing again like yeah. how do you do it without being like oh so how do you feel about this yeah. rather than actually you know so they would be the best two to ask how that what happens with the supermarket thing like to go through or to the food banks um if we talk about a movie that has that like maybe i daniel blake maybe we should have one of them either both of them or one of them on to do it well um, so the church that i have had rehearsals in um they have a food bank connected to them and so we see quite a lot of people um coming through and bringing like bags and bags and bags of stuff and um also people that come specifically for the food or uh, any products that they need and um i think what was nice and in in terms of how easy it was how friendly it was but also how (laughs) harrowing because there was a boy who looked like he was 15 and he was dirty and he looked so awkward and timid and like ill and it was really heartbreaking because it was like there's nothing i can do but this is this is the problem that we're facing that like this is this spans all ages and we don't know how you would get into that situation but that could be you one day and it's Mm. like it's so important that these things are out there and it's um it, it's not and it's easy you know it's accessible and people know about it um because it's everywhere and mm. i think that shocked me because it's something that you, you you're not it, it's not always in your face all the time but when you see when you know you're just walking and doing whatever you're doing um and then someone walks in and is like very timidly like in the hallway just waiting for someone to give them a bag of supplies it's yeah. like but where is that boy now going? Do you know what I mean? Like, why had I had no idea if he was just going into the street? It's interesting to link back to the film because the start of the film with him, um, where we first introduced to Steph, mm. is she's there's like a collection table for homeless people at winter, and that to link into Scotland. Um, when I was a kid at my primary school, I don't know if you had this Anouk. Yeah, uh, harvest festivals. Yeah, we did that too. So for international listeners and yeah, and a har- the harvest festival, if you don't, if they don't have it, is um like in autumn, like usually like September. Um, at my primary school, you had to bring in like tins of stuff, like tinned fruit, tinned vegetables, tinned whatever you had, and you would collect it, and then it was given to um older people in the community. Then that was when I was at primary school. I would be I would be surprised if now it's not collection for food banks food and stuff banks. like like that. So yeah, there is there is in this film the the homelessness issue is raised to bring us gently back into the the film area. I was I was talking to Pasha and Christy actually the other day, uh, the other day, a Friday, um and the you could just see the emotion that they had. It was like a, an immediate emotional connection that they had that maybe if you didn't know or you hadn't been or you hadn't seen certain things, you wouldn't have. So I think that just reiterates the fact of like, I think sleeping rough for one night is as good because just seeing that emotional connection in there, because they've seen they've done a play and they've talked to people that are actually going through it. It's the same thing. It's like you and I think human beings are like that. You know, you always hear, oh, I started up this charity because my mom died or my sister has this disease that like you only have that connection if you know or you've seen it firsthand Mm. and so yeah i think that's it's a very human thing um and it's really needed so i i disagree that it's patronizing or especially if you do it in a respectful way like of course if you know you're going to a food bank and you're like um well some of them feel like uh, there are plenty of people really annoyed by Bono uh, because what he's doing feels a bit weird for a billionaire. Right, right, right. But do you know the heckle story about that? No. You know the, the when he's doing um, it was either Live Aid or Band Aid, and he goes, "Every time I snap my fingers, a child in Africa dies." And somebody in the crowd goes, "Well, stop 
clicking your fingers then. <laughs> oh, no. You know, my dad told me that one. I don't know if it was in Scotland, but it's more for... I can imagine a Scottish or a British crowd doing that, you know, that heckle. But that is quite a British thing, yeah. I don't um, know. Everyone is dying to hear about your music analysis now. Adam. Oh, we're here. Right. Yeah. So, well, this afternoon while I was doing the dishes, I was like, oh, you know what? I'll put the headphones on and I'll give um, I'll listen to some music. And I thought, you know what? I'll go and listen to Anna and the Apocalypse because I really did like a lot of the songs. I'll give it a go. So I was listening to it. And this film describes itself as a, a Christmas uh, zombie musical. And it's very accurate, especially in some music choices. Um, in all of the songs that I listen to, there is either the sleigh bells going like in the background, almost like in a lot of tracks, you'll have a clicked track, not even a click track, just like the whole like um, a drum beat, you know, like, you know, in any club music you'll hear, drummers call it four to the floor, which is essentially you just hit the bass pedal four times and it continues so people can dance to the beat that's mainly why four four to the floor is used because it's easy for people to follow mm -hmm. i had a drum tutor that was in a when he was in a band um the band had written a oh no it was my music teacher actually uh, mr livingston they had a song that was in seven eight which meant every time you got to the end of the song the beat wasn't there so you would have people dancing and they would play it at these live gigs purely because people would be trying to dance to it. And then whenever the next verse started, they would be out of time and they couldn't work out why they were out of time. Mm. They're like, how, how did we miss a beat? And it's because it was composed in a different time signature than then standard dancing. Anyway, so the fact that they use sleigh bells that are underlying in most of the tracks and also the keyboard sound effects are very like Christmassy sounding, you know, like that really bright, almost... Um, you know, uh, feed the world. You know that very like high, high sound of the keyboard. The do 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 do. Those sort of key sounds that are in there, they're present without through most of the tracks, especially um, um, Soldier of War, which is Nick's song. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, even in a Hollywood ending, you can hear the the sleigh bells are in there as well. So there's a lot of music that is in there that emphasizes the Christmassy feel to it mm. which I feel is a really good decision because that also whereas people relate to you know Die Hard being a Christmas movie the music in here will remind you of Christmas no matter what time of the year you see it the yeah. film will work if you see it whenever you want but there is that little Christmassy thing in the music that you go oh yeah it's Christmas yeah, okay. So that was quite nice in there. The, um, in the credits of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the very last song, if you don't go into the end, you don't hear it, is Spidey Bells, Spidey Bells. And then there's a point where the guy, he's actually talking to you, why did I go into this crappy song? I did studies. And very, <laughs> <laughs> very, which you will miss if you don't go into the end, and you should because it's essentially a Marvel movie. Love, uh -huh. So you got uh, a very funny and very smart. Um, I, was, I was trying to work ending. out if um, Not a Hollywood Ending is a marathon, which we've seen before um, in a film that we've probably, we've discussed it before. I know we definitely have talked about a marathon in one of the episodes. Um, whereas the best example is in, um, well, Les Mis or the one I know off by heart um, is the, the Tonight from West Side Story where they're all like singing together. Um, oh, about different things. Yeah, this so a, a marathon is when it's the same song where they're singing different lines, but it still works all together. You know, which is obnoxiously ah, uh, overlap here on podcasting. Yeah, um, why? Yeah. I know why we talked about it. We never recorded the episode. We didn't do the South Park episode, did we? No, we didn't. No, because it was in there. The the song they, they even quoted. They go, "When did this song become a marathon?" Because they're singing different things. I don't think, I don't know. I couldn't work out in my head because I know they were singing different lines because um, Lisa and her boyfriend, I can't remember his name. Um, Chris. Chris. They're singing their lines, which is like, we're a perfect match, I hope this never ends. And then Anna's singing her bit. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't work out if, that's, if that counts as a marathon or not. It might be. I don't know enough about like the actual technicalities of what makes it a marathon. But it's close. Or it has a marathon-esque feel. I'll go as far as that to say. Um, also, musically wise, I thought that I said this earlier that, that the way that they're they're layered into the the narrative as well is very good. 
Uh, and it twists, it also twists when you think there would be one. Because if it was a traditional musical, right, you would have when when John sacrifices himself, that would be a song. You know, like him being eaten by the zombie would be a song. And almost they have that in Les Mis when um Oh no, I can't remember names. Stars, isn't it? When he's about to jump off the bridge. No, no, no. no. Well, yes, but um, when um, Eponine is shot. Oh yeah. Um, she dies in. Um, Marius. What's his, yeah, Marius's arms, because and she sings a song. Um, uh, uh, rain the... will make the flowers grow. Mm. But the the one that got the Oscar to Anna the other way. No, that's Anne Hathaway. That's the I dreamed a dream. Eponine is played by, is it Samantha something? She's actually Eponine in the uh, West End. Um, oh. So she's a musical theatre actress. The, the other thing I was going to mention about the music is I, I, I even thought, and it was quite nice because they kind, they sort of did it. The very last song, which is when everyone is dying, the, our dad is dying, um the the scene that Nuke briefly mentioned with the two Lisa and Chris touch hands as zombies and it's Anna and Nick outside singing as the zombies come closer in. You know, I was listening to that one as well and it's very nicely done where they're like you f- you almost want it to cut to um back to Chris and him be alive, not fully turned yet, so that he could sing. But it doesn't. So it, it, it again with the the idea of like this isn't fully a musical. It's a zombie film. It's a zomb. It's a zombie musical effect. Like it's it's a bit of both that it doesn't completely stick to the narrative of like all right, let's everyone have a song. Like even if they were dying, they would sing. Mm. Like um, or even if they actually were a zombie. <laughs> yeah, a zombie singing like how in I don't know if Jan's seen it, but at the end is the first series of Skins. It like stops and it becomes they start singing. Um, it's not Mad World, is it? It's um, I can't remember the name of the song. It's I don't remember it, but I've seen it. Uh, uh, you know the bit skins. where you know the bit where at the end after thingy gets hit by a boss and says, "What's his face with the heart?" The uh, oh, baby, baby, it's a man. Wow, I think it, it may be Mad World, like that one. They sing that, and even um, it's Wild World. Isn't Wild it? World, that's it. Uh, even the guy that's hit by the boss is singing it as well. So it, there's it's everything like there. Sid starts it. Sid, he? that was the name. Yeah, Sid. Oh, I used to love Sid. Um, so yeah, and also nice, nice touch as well is the, the almost the battle between the the teacher and Anna, um, like put on a show in the in the in the hall was a good song as well. Yeah. Last thing about the music, it's um, it's produced by Interscope. Interscope for people that don't know, they should watch the. The Defiance ones on Netflix, or I think it's HBO have it as well. I think it might be an HBO documentary. So if you're in America, it might be on HBO Go, uh, their streaming service. But it's about the the partnership between Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre, and they founded Interscope Records. So uh, this this album is produced by the same record company that produced Eminem stuff and Gwen Stefani stuff and Lady Gaga and many other big names. So I thought that was quite cool little link as well um i must say and this will explain uh my rating later that every time uh that breakaway song comes up i and i what more watching it rather than listening up actually i get uh goosebumps which one's breakaway again that's when she is that's the very first well the very first song which is before the title is the uh, Christmas it means nothing uh, without you, yeah. but the, the no, first one that. after that. Yeah, yeah that's when she's a through the, song. Fr- she's going through the hallway. Yeah. yeah. And him, yeah, they're all in different bits singing about their lives. Yeah, that's a good one as well. I hadn't listened to that when I was cleaning the dishes, but if I had, I'd probably have mentioned Isn't it. Isn't that a marathon? I f- it might be. It might be, but I don't think they all join in at the same time. No, oh, do they not? No. No, I think it's all segmented. Oh, okay. If they, join, if they jam- joined in together, it might be. Right, okay. So Hollywood ending is a little bit more, but I don't know if they have the yeah, same Yeah, Hollywood words, ending yeah. is closer because the end of it is like a marathon, not the, the beginning of it. Um, yeah, there are two oh, of, of three songs where they do that, but not mm. the more. So yeah, every time, like, it was, well, the three times I've seen it. So that's a pretty good sign of uh, 
what I feel about something usually. Mm. Mm-hmm. I did like that this film, and this is the point I've said I'd talk about later, is it balanced so much of horror that I didn't really expect it to. Um, because when you hear of a, a zombie musical, you're like, all right, it's not going to be a full-on zombie film. But this really tapped into a lot of a lot of stuff that some zombie films even miss, you know? And it plays with funnier ones. There's almost an homage to um, Cockneys versus Zombies in this. Cockneys versus Zombies is a... I haven't seen the full film, but the scene that I'm reminded of, there's a scene in Cockneys versus Zombies where they're, they're all... They've just realized the outbreak's happening. And they're like older people. They're like, they're like older Cockneys. Um, like retirement home age because the scene i'm talking about in the film is when the the old folks sit on the on the when they're hiding in the ball pit Mm. they're using it like a like a trojan horse you know Mm. they're hiding in it and then the old woman sits on it yeah in cockneys versus zombies there's a scene where an older man is like asleep in a deck chair and the what the leader of the group shouting and i can't remember his name i'll just say reg behind you and he turns around and there's a zombie and it's the zombie really walking slowly and the cockney guy like using a zimmer frame to like run away so i really like that sort of comedic with old people in a zombie film that was here to the contrasting sense by the end of the film if we start like Shaun of the dead the end of the film is like 28 days later mm-hmm. like just the darkness that's presented the the, the reality of yeah, everyone's everyone's dead you know the, yeah. and the, the heroes are it looks like they're going out because it's, I thought like maybe Steph had just grabbed the keys and, and ran, you know, because it's so unclear. You never know if it's going to happen. And I liked that there was not a predictability in some zombie films that there is because, you know, they're trying to capture what either Dawn of the Dead or Shaun of the Dead, Shaun of the Dead reinvented with comedy. They're always going for the sort of the same strategies, you know, like, you know, the outbreak happens, the lone survivor, lone survivor finds group, group have a, co- a clash of leadership. Um, there's always one guy that's a bit more annoying. He gets t- torn apart. Uh, Likeable people die, and then you know, like trapped to the end, only a few people left. It's like so, there is these set pieces that a lot of zombie films have, but this one, even though they were kind of there, you know, like we have to get to this place because people we know are there. But even if that's a trait, that's what you would do. I feel like, for example, if I was if if a nuke was in a certain place and I was in a certain place, I'm like I'm gonna try and get there. Because I, the person I care, the, the the person I care about, might be alive or dead. So there was a lot in here that I was so impressed that it didn't become just like standard zombie film. Like it kept the twists and the turns and stuff. And it and again with the music, it was a nice way of probably probably separating um, that from any other film. Because I also feel that if you took one aspect away from it, would the film work on its own? And I'm quite happy to say that I don't want to do it either. You know, in some kinds, sometimes when you get a film that's like, oh, it's part comedy, it's part drama, you're like, well, the drama side was better, but the comedy side was better. This one, it balances both. Like, both are integral to the story and the, the storytelling, which I thought was really uh, quite impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, to be a bit more specific about the, what this film does to me, I used goosebumps, but you know that... Um, I don't know, it's a bit more like a shiver. You know, uh, it probably won't speak to any female listeners, but when you're a man and you're about to take a pee, there's one moment that you get, uh, like if you were electrified, like the kind of thingy. Um, the the early, the first pee you do in the morning is quite a good analogy for that. The, the Like, ah, the niceness to it. Yeah, well, it's like this, something that lasts uh, less than a second, like this kind of mm. instant sec- tenth of a second bliss. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you uh, that th- that's what I've been feeling the three times I've watched that specific start of Breakaway. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like uh, it, I agree with that mostly because of quite a lot of the things that they were singing about I I could relate to, mm. like being at school and feeling like no one really understood you and being feeling lonely and not really knowing what's happening you know tomorrow and the next few years like should i go to uni or should i do go to australia and Mm. all this kind of stuff like uh will i get the girl and i probably won't and oh she doesn't like me he doesn't like me all of these things that we kind of go through but it was quite stark and i think that's what 
growing up can be like like mm. it's quite it can be quite a dark moment um especially if you don't have like you know your support network around you blah 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 yeah so um or yeah. or maybe it's just me being obsessed with the um ella hunt's voice Yeah, she's I don't know. But she, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's weird. She's not ginger. Maybe he didn't ginger. Something yeah. Anouk said to me the other day was quite interesting. That uh, some people might pick apart this film. It's like, oh, it says it's Scottish, but there's not not everyone is a Scottish actor. And I kind of disagree with that. Is like Anouk said, especially that it had a universal feel for Britain. Like it could be, it could be anywhere. You know, it could be any school in Britain, which. I think it's a really good point, actually. It so it's Sport Glasgow, and they made it into New Haven, which is uh, I wondered also, which is it looks and feels and sounds a bit like it's supposed to be in the US, doesn't it? <laughs> At some point, because I heard, or maybe it was because of someone's accent that I had. Like, oh, they used that kind of version of the world, which is American. Mm. I felt like the town was really British, though. Yeah, like that didn't feel American at all. Mm. I think. Um, I think the setting we we are so used to it being in America, so like you know, like people singing through school halls and stuff, and like locker room, like whatever. Um, yeah, that those moments were like, oh, that. But I, f I think the town was really British, and I quite liked that because it was like you don't see that very much, do you? Oh, the school felt so British. It was great. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're it just did. you're just with the t especially right with the tables with the wheels yeah like yeah. that's what my tables at primary school were like and they, they got pushed to the side of the <laughs> hall and that would be where jim was it was like i'm like oh especially with the scene where they're pushing them back trying to fight off the zombies with oh, the they, table when they, like, fall i'm like that is together. yeah i'm just like that is a great I, that's <laughs> amazing i love that oh dear yeah Really Almost good. expected that scene from like start throwing, get the bag of random balls that was in every gym hall, yeah, just yeah. throwing basketball and do dodge balls at them. Um, yeah. Do we do we feel we have stuff to add? A good way to wrap it up for me is I liked also this film's way of calling back to itself and refs and foreshadowing the ending. For example, with the the teacher, we have the the star that comes down. Like that's in the beginning as well, and that's ultimately how he meets his end. Yeah. And also the car. We start in the car, we end in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We start going we start going to school and we end leaving the school. Leaving school. So there is a lot of that which I, I do like in Steph is great. films. Yeah. Boom, boom. Saved your life. Save, yeah. <laughs> I I liked how kind of brutal she was and like um just kind of starkly saying what was needed to say, like um, but she was the one that was kind of not really understood in the beginning and she kind of saved nearly everyone's life throughout the whole thing. Like mm. She was the one person that kind of came through. What did you guys think about the, the headmaster? Quite strange. Yeah. I, I feel like um, he was kind of pantomime at times. Um, like the song that he has when he's like locked up in the, <laughs> yeah. in the kind of dining, like the kitchen, the kitchen area. Yeah. yeah. Um, it felt quite pantomime or um, stereotypical baddie song, um, or that like he he was kind of slowly going mad, um, but like really over the top. Mm. Um, and so like the, there were moments where it was like you know suspend your disbelief or or your own reality. Like this is you know back to watching a film, which yeah. is a bit more fun because it had the lighting as well, which was kind of darker and. Um, he had this crazy hair and there, crazy scientist look. And they were actually, they talk about his disbelief suspending in one song. Mm. I've, uh, I think that's Hollywood ending. Watching the version with the with the lyrics in the popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. He has a verse on that as well. Actually, the teacher does have. Yes, yeah, slowly. Yeah, that's, true. that's the one I did that. Uh, at the, the start of this episode. Oh, was it? <laughs> that was my impression of, uh, of Professor him. Savage. I'm sorry, and I missed that. <laughs> I actually, I to begin with, I was like, oh, he's a bit caricature-y, but, but it was quite nice to see that, the you know, because you there was always, a, we had a teacher like that at high school, and it was just like, like an ultra stickler for the rule, and he was a dickhead. Because he came, it was funny, because we were in the final year of high school, and he came in and tried to like, as upset his authority and we're like mm. we're leaving in like six weeks yeah who are you we're like we really don't care what you're trying to achieve here we're like yeah he once took out 
He once took out a guy. There's a guy in my year called Lewis Simpson. Uh, this is a great shout out for people from Dunfermline because um, my friends all know Lewis. Uh, this song, this song, this story is um, we had um, study periods, which essentially in fifth or sixth year you choose what subjects you take and you don't have to fill all the columns. So if you have a free column, whenever what everyone else is at a class, you would have a study period. Um, and you had to sign yourself in to prove that you were there. You couldn't just like bunk off and go like down the shops. Although people would and they would just get your mate to sign you in. Mm. Anyway, so that's what happened. He was like, I'm going to be a bit late. Sign me in. And his mate signed him in under the name, under a name that wasn't his own. And um, <laughs> the guy came in and he was like, he um, he looked at the list and went, Lewis Simpson, can I like see you outside? Um, and so he goes outside. I'm like, why is he getting pulled out? And he came back in and he was so annoyed. And we're like, why did you get pulled out? He's like, <laughs> because my mate signing me in is Lewis Pugwash Simpson. Like, I was like, that was the stick. That's how much of a stickler of the rule is. This because you'd put like a funny name in the middle of your name. He was like, why have you signed in like this? And it's like, get over yourself, Robbo. Get over yourself, Mr. Yeah. Robinson. It's Wait. like, you're upset, like ridiculous. We have a nickname in French for those type of people. Petit chef, <laughs> which is those people who have whatever small their amount of power they were given, they use it, they use it to the maximum they can. I bet you had a lot of that in the navy. I bet. I bet. Uh, there would, um, I bet there, should, there would have been some people that as soon as they got like a little bit of responsibility were a bit. OTT. Well, the thing is, as the um, so you've got the rank people, so the smallest, then you've got petty officers and then officers mm. and as officers their schools they're told from the start that they're the best they tend to take that in their mind mm. at some point and, <laughs> and uh yeah there are some but uh, on the whole uh except one guy on my very very first ship uh actually you no know, um, always uh went rather smoothly that's not bad yeah. But yeah, to round off, so I did know some. I did know a, a teacher that was like that. So that mixed in with you know, there's always the guy in the zombie movie that is a bit mad, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was a night amalgamation. And finally, before I know, we're going to go into the rating. Um, shout out to the actor that plays Mister Gill, the retiring headmaster. In the shot where he's like just chatting to his two school kids, I'm like, I quite like this acting in the background for an extra, like just doing a bit extra. And then obviously in the in the school show, he's like so happily bobbing along with the the Aww. really innuendo -y song. And I was yeah. like, that's that's some great stuff. So sweet. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, we good? Chris grandmother with the two thumbs up. Oh yeah. yeah. Aww. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Right. So Anuk Yan was Anna and the Apocalypse. Good, bad, or just plain standard. Anuk. Oh, so good, so good. Uh, almost almost a masterpiece. Uh, uh, Yan. Well, I'll put him. I'll put that in a category, and um, where I would put once more with feeling, uh, Doctor Horrible, uh, my left right foot that I saw on stage, it's perfect. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I I would say it's I'd say it's a it's a genre changer. Uh, if Shaun of the Dead reinvented comedy, this reinvented the idea of musical coming of age and zombie films. So for me. Yeah, masterpiece. I really super enjoyed this. This is my film of the year. <laughs> it's like this is on, especially as it's like a smaller budget. You know, something that comes out this well together um, and not interfered with like massive producers. That or if it was, you can't tell. Um, there's something really magical about this piece of cinema. So for me, it's a it's a strong masterpiece. It's in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 All right. And I do remember everyone listening that I have um huge struggles with musical but uh, yeah that will be one big exception to the rule yeah. we're slowly converting you Jan. yeah <laughs> so glad so glad cool yeah. um to con so i'll talk about so it actually it's for our patrons um but only for patrons who's been supporting us for a while <laughs> because it's easier so we've got some stuff for you guys and to make it easy, you just have to select what you want and we'll give it to you when next time we see you. Because we don't like to post stuff. So there's the uh, CD, that's the album with the special cover. The cartoonish cover. Oh, nice. And the standard one, which is uh, 
more standard. And the book. Just not just plain standard, I hope. No, no, no. <laughs> That's the uh, the other one is if one is um on the back you've got the Orion logo. All right, the, uh, okay. the, stu- the movie studio actually picked it up the for the US. You know you remember the that the well, Orion. Orion. I don't know how you pronounce that, but that's the constellation. Orion. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. The book, that's a novelization, apparently, so... Oh, very uh, cool. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. And, obviously, we've got a few of those uh, Scottish posters right there. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much... And also one vinyl, because I ordered one for myself and a second one, Ooh. which will come rather soon. It's been delayed, not released on the 7th, but on the 14th. And a few stuff unrelated, but in Behind the Candelabra, which was recorded before this, at the end we said, oh, the next episode will be Anna and the Apocalypse, which is not right, because we're releasing Anna on Christmas, hey. which, which seems fitting. Yeah, uh, But definitely. still, uh, Quantum Leap, I talked in Behind the Candelabra, I got the box set today, which is... Actually, I'd like to congratulate and thank everyone involved in the making of this show uh, for many reasons, but right now specifically for the fact that it was one of the few shows that were shot on 35 millimeters at the time. Ooh, nice. So it's actually been restored in full uh, full HD, which is quite nice. nice. Lovely. Yeah, and also I just uh, subscribed to this Little magazine. Oh, is that the Edgar Wright cover? Yeah, that's the Edgar. Well, this one I got on eBay because I was not subscribed when it happened. Oh, nice. Yeah, you've got uh, Empire Thirties celebrating adventurous filmmaking. Yeah, they had they had a recent one out that was a whole magazine devoted to Alien that I never picked up. But yes, I, I, was, I looked at. It, I was like, oh, that's quite nice. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. That's so uh, these are a little thank you to our patrons. Like I believe you on right. Absolutely. Right. You just uh, I posted some stuff, so you just need. Uh, yeah, I'll post the list on the list. Which well, well, it will already be out when you see this episode. Yeah. Anyway, so you'll know about that already. Cool. And yeah, vinyl. This is the one I got also. Uh, and bio records. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, I've been on a vinyl craziness lately. I'm not entirely sure how it started, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we should say because this probably will be like episode like sixty. 766 something around that right yeah um so we're pretty cl- we're getting close to the 100 mark so if you're thinking about becoming a patreon subscriber uh, on the back of we're giving away stuff like this uh we should mention that giving away stuff will not be based on your level of donation so if you donate one dollar and you've been donate you've you've been subscribed for like a longer period because i know what Jan tra- what Jan's saying um there will be no discrepancy on what you can get so if you join up now and by the time we hit 100 and give away some more stuff probably you'll be eligible no matter how much you donate so don't feel that you have to give like loads of money to get a better thing because that's not the case no no No, yeah yeah it's just like uh the latest patreon we had just happened yeah that's true yeah so uh yeah cool so that's so uh, merry christmas and thank you all for the patreons that we have and all the listeners at home Uh, that constantly turn up to listen to us ramble about films. Um, without <laughs> you, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be doing this because um, we uh, every time we do one of these moments, we're like, oh, we just started this as something to do, but um, I can't imagine not doing this now. So just yeah. it's nice to know people listen. So thank oh. you very much for continuing to turn up for any movie that we talk about, yeah, especially this one because this one deserves to be talked about. Um, yeah, I saw cool. somebody post on there's a community on facebook for actors that it's majority is a uh, student projects or like short films and stuff like that talking about we need to get the word out about Anne and the apocalypse and i think that's very true because i would love to see this get a, a wide release um and see it again so oh yeah when i saw it in september last year was there, with cat we we're like well they're going to make a ton of money <laughs> yeah. yeah so if you have if you, if you like the sound of a, a music if you like the sound of the premise of a zombie musical you won't be disappointed. Even if you're not a fan of musicals, because Jan has been bowled over by this. So you owe it to yourself to watch this one. If there's one film to watch this year, I would say definitely this one. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, sorry, what? Definitely. That's bo- that's twice you've said that word and Jan's missed it. 
<laughs> no, no, it's not that I missed it, but I t- I was starting to talk at the same time, so to avoid annoying overlaps. Oh dear. Uh, and to conclude, I'd like to point everyone here to a wonderful app called Spotist on the App Store. <laughs> And if you use the code Yan, shut up, Yan. Uh, you'll oh, be able come to, on. You'll be able to get extra lives. <laughs> uh, ten years ago, I started to purchase. Well, twenty. Well, a while ago, to purchase a mag- magic tricks or magical stuff on a website called Penguin Magic, and it turns out that a few months ago they had a plan to do this little app that actually makes you spot differences between two images and win real cash. And uh, that's uh, that's what I've been trying to do to win real cash for a daily. We all play this. This isn't an ad, by the way, just, just so you know, we've not been paid to say this. Jan has shamelessly plugged his own tag so he can get extra lives yeah, and but- win more money. So we maybe we should put all should put all our names out like we did with the Cine World card that one time on this episode. You we'll ha- put each one's codes out. Do you have them already? Yeah, I updated it. You, you, okay. As soon as you update the app, you get it as well. Okay, so what's yours? Uh, Adam? Probably oh. Edam. E D A M. I'll sh- I'll share it for the the link of this one when it goes public. Um, yeah, it's cool. So just to round off, uh, what's your how much money have you won each on Spotist? Oh, like two dollars. Two dollars. How uh, much are you at? Yeah. Uh, for the four weeks of beta tests, which was because uh, when you with test flight on Apple Store, it's limited to hundred people. Mm. So I must have earned, and I only played four times in three weeks. So that's well, twenty. Uh, that's not bad. But I I must have earned max uh, twenty on the new one with everyone involved. So fourteen total something. I think I'm it's like twelve. So it's fun though. It's a good game. Uh, it's so fun. I'm really bad at it. I, <laughs> I still play it every time I can. Like it's it's so much fun. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thanks for listening. <gasps> happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays wherever you are in the world. Christmas is all around me. And so the feeling <laughs> grows. And if we get uh I'm gonna get naked. No. Mm. Uh kids so uh don't so buy drugs where where will we be each of one of us if this comes out on the 25th where are we all berlin well me and anuka are in berlin probably enjoying some early morning beverages mm-hmm. of the beer kind where are you yeah i'm back in provence i'll be with family uh it's yeah good. in provence yeah, provence. yeah nice my brother's little family uh part of the uk family won't be because he does one year in France, one year in uh, we kind of, London. We kind of do the oh, same nice. thing, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so they'll be around on the 20, 27th or something. Cool. Nice. Yeah. All right. See you, see you in the new year. The next episode you'll probably hear after this is the 2018 It's a Wrap, which we'll need, we'll need to do, which probably will be like a 15, 20 minute episode of us talking about. Spidey bells, spidey yeah, bells, just jingle yeah. all the way. Okay, yeah, indeed. So see you around. See and you as around. always, uh, we were Adam, Anouk, and Jan. Bye bye. 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 Thank you for listening to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Just Plain Standard podcast. If you like what you heard, you can leave us a review via iTunes. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Good Bad Standard Podcast on both platforms. If you fancy seeing the live streams that we talk about in the podcast, they can be found on youtube.com. You search for Milk in a Wine Glass. There are other bits and bobs in there too, just to see what Jan's up to during the week. And if you really like us, like really, really like us, why don't you head on over to patreon.com slash goodbadstandardpodcast and have a look if you want to support us. Any small donation is appreciated.